Dungeons and Dragons is in a very bad position right now. I have tried so many times to get this video out. In fact, this was actually supposed to come out roughly last year involving the recent errata changes for some of the books. But delaying this for so long and sitting on it and just kind of going throughout the years and having so much other news, I kind of have a lot more to talk about. So much of D&D at the moment has just kind of shifted, it's changed, and to my point of view, it's not for the better. It's also just very hard for me to like get the right words for what I want to say with this, just with all the editing, so I'm just going to have to try and be very blunt and very quick with most of my information here, just to finally get it out the door before anything else changes, and not having to like fully scrap or have to redo all of this all over again. So with that, let's jump right into the controversy. A couple years ago on Twitter, someone basically saw the description of orcs from Volo's Guide and summarized, this is racist. And because Twitter is, you know, the favorite outcry platform of people, it quickly blew up into a I'm right, you're wrong argument. And you were either on the side of, yes, this is racist and bad, no, this is not, it's make-believe, and of course if you were in the particular crowd, you think we look like orcs? Now one particular post I found on Reddit I actually thought was really good, as it gave the perspective from a person of color on the situation. Short of it being, it's fine to challenge fantasy tropes and stereotypes, but comparing fictional races to real world people can be problematic. Yes, you can make the argument that fantasy is very much heavily influenced by the real world, but that doesn't necessarily, it's always a one-to-one -one ratio. And unless you're really trying to make a certain statement, no one's really going to take it that seriously. And then there was Extra Credits and their Evil's Races video. Don't. Now, in regards to this tweet, I want to make some counterpoints. One, the book is supposed to be written to have a certain viewpoint. It's written based on the views of a fictional character of Volo. So it's supposed to maybe have some biases to it, because that's supposed to be the character as a part of the setting and part of the world building. Which leads me to my second point. This book is very heavily tied to one specific setting. The Forgotten Realms, which in general is just generic fantasy. Orcs in this setting were created by an evil god, and you know what? That is legit, because not all orcs in every single setting are the same. Warhammer orcs come from fungus. Orcs in Heroes of Might and Magic, I believe, were basically scientific guinea pigs by wizards. Lord of the Rings are corrupted elves. No, and orcs in Eberron, another setting that D&D created, as far as I can tell, are different than the orcs in the Forgotten Realms. Not every orc is written the same throughout the game. Three, the argument falls a bit flat when you can simply look at the player's handbook. In fact, better yet, I took the liberty of looking through all of the other like modules and adventures through 5e's past so far, and I found that there were a pretty good amount of representation of black people in there. It really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Especially when later I found this article stating like, oh, the history of D&D has always been viewed as like white Europeans, but once again, not only is there a black woman as the cover art for the human section in the player's handbook, in the description it says humans come in a wide, wide variety of colors, shapes, and sizes. There's even the article acknowledges this, and it just, it makes no sense. The last argument I want to make in regards to this post, why only orcs? What's exactly stopping you from complaining about, say, the gnolls and not associating another minority with them? They're almost created the exact same way, they almost have the same bloodlust and like warlike nature they have, but they get a free pass because, hey, I guess they don't look human enough or because they actually come out of a demon's asshole. I mean, next you're going to say that a race is supposed to be a representation of a real-life race because of their skin color, God damn it! Hey, okay, so let's go over the drow and dark elves while we're on this topic. This one is a bit more understandable for controversy, especially considering some of the artwork released for them back in the day. A dark-skinned evil race that hates and fights their lighter-toned kin, you can see a better argument and see where kind of the racist connections are there. However, I do want to make an argument against this, mainly with when Gygax was designing the system and the sources he was drawing from. The first of which comes from North Mythology and the book of the Prose Edda, written by Snorri Sturluson. Now from this book, we do get the concept of like elves and dark elves. However, dark elves are a little weird because they actually have two definitions, which I am very much going to get wrong. The Dokfar and the Svart, the Dokafar, the Dokafar and the Svartafar, which in two different translations means dark elves and black elves. Now, 
most scholars have kind of agreed that they might just mean the exact same thing. However, one scholar by the name of Jacob Grimm proposed that there were actually three elves, with dark elves actually having more of a dingy and pale look to them, as he also drew parallels between other legends around that time. Additionally, there's also conflict of, say, like, whether or not maybe these terms were just to describe other dwarves, as Dark Elves were also described as subterranean dwellers. And there's also some discussion on whether or not there is maybe some Christian influence, as well as the fact that Snorri wrote the Prose Edda around the period when Christianity had really kind of claimed the region he was in, and that possibly he drew some influence of Christianity while writing these tales. The second reference that Gygax looked to was from of Thomas Knightley's work, which possibly within one of his books it described Dark Elves with evil nature, and probably more or less drew on the ideas and fantasies that they had. Like, for example, that they were evil sprites, right, and caused elf shock. Gygax was also kind of coined the term drow from the old Scottish term of troll, which was just a imperative of troll. And even then, when you kind of look at some of the sources, also kind of describes them as underground elves represented as skillful workers in metal. Now, I don't know about you, but from my view of this, I don't really see drow as another comparison to blacks. Elves, like orcs, at the end of the day are myth and mythos. And at least unless I really want to do some deep digging outside of Wikipedia, there really isn't any other description on what dark elves were outside of the physical description. This Gygax also was just kind of wanting to create a general enemy for the Underdark. This, I mean, if we really want to go for the source of Dark Elves, the only other personal terms I can think of are maybe from Pathfinder with the Muwale. Dark Elves can also just generally appear in other franchises as well. For, again, Warhammer and Heroes of Might and Magic have them, but they take on more Grimm's idea of what Dark Elves were, actually being much more pale and light-skinned, even more so than other Elves. Okay. And really, the only other time I can think of, like, Dark Elves actually referring to Black Elves in the way that you're kind of thinking it is in anime. Hentai 2. Now, of course, with all this controversy and whatnot, Wizards has taken action. They talked about having more progressive changes, removing negative modifiers from kobolds and orcs, trigger warnings to old products, sensitivity readers, and promoting on seeking new diverse talent, which even still, to some, is not enough unless it's throughout the whole company, because... Of course. Now, these changes were further made throughout a dump of ratas with all their previously published content. For printed books, you don't necessarily have to apply these since, you know, you already have the printed books, but for stuff like online copies, well, you're shit out of luck because they're already probably now applied. And some of the biggest changes of these also came, of course, from Volos because, once again, work controversy. Various descriptions on role-playing certain monsters and monster races are just gone. The previously mentioned orc kobold changes, as well as the removal of cannibalism, sacrifice, and slavery. The latter of which I really want to emphasize now. Like, just... Is slavery really too much of a taboo topic to discuss or mention now, even in a game? Most parties of players are going to be good aligned, especially now since Wizards is no longer publishing any sort of, like, evil player content like they did in the past. And players would also want to usually fight against slavery. So why are we trying to remove the subject? The, I, I want to bring up Pathfinder momentarily because I, a friend of mine previously t uh, told me that Pathfinder actually had removed the concept of slavery from an entire city. But they didn't really replace the lore on how it was built with anything else. However, as I kind of did a bit more research... Pathfinder has absolutely gone off the deep end by saying we are going to be removing slavery from all of our settings and systems and everything and just... Oh my goodness, are you serious? <sighs> to sum up the section, because this has gone on long enough, 5e has started to change on how it's being handled because of someone screaming about diversity problems on one single platform. Yet diversity could and was already available in the game to begin with, whether you made it yourself in your own setting or found it in the modules if you paid attention enough. Godfrey and Vladimir in the Curse of Strahd module are actually a nice couple. I had no idea on that until I actually read the details. Harsh topics, like slavery, can still serve a purpose to fight against and give reason for your characters to do what they do. Wizards' attempt to fix all this overall felt like a band-aid as Aradas only do so much and they were mostly just stripping stuff out. To end off the old audio from there, I briefly want to go over the latest, or latest, Hadozi controversy. Which in reality is just or Controversy 2.0. There's not much to it. This is also just kind of the controversy I 
kind of want to skip over, mostly because when I kind of dig more into the details, it really starts to get messy. And I'm just tired of arguing this whole dance of, you know, fictional stuff equals reality a lot of the time. I just have to ask, if this was just like fully flying squirrels, would we even be having the same conversation? And similar to before, when I was at least skimming this giant post saying like, here's everything wrong with the Hadozi, one comment below that apparently got like a lot of traction, kind of just stating that they're kind of sick of this whole situation of people being offended on their behalf. I think it's way more interesting to hear from the people who are supposedly offended by this to kind of speak for themselves and just say, I didn't see anything wrong. A lot of people, myself included, just thought like the even the small addition of slavery to the lore was now just to honestly felt a lot more like a reference to the Planet of the Apes remake. That's what I think a lot of people thought when they read this, not immediately going into the transatlantic slave trade. Maybe it's also just a combination of the fact that monkey is an insult to black people, especially in uh, Portugal, I guess. Even though we've seen this kind of pose and character before in other artworks by wizards, just, I think a combination just kind of really set this off, unfortunately. And I don't necessarily think it was intentional. And just now the whole situation has just spiraled out of control to the point where we're basically now the Hadozi don't even have art on D&D Beyond, and their lore is like literally just a paragraph and a fraction of what they were, and they just kind of seem bland and boring now. At least from like a lore perspective and how they kind of came to be. Now let's jump off the train of one controversial race and talk about just races as a whole. Most of us are familiar with the standard array that we're used to. Human, dwarf, elf. Over time, we've gotten, like, minotaurs, you know, tieflings. We've gotten now, like, bugmen and plasmoid goo girls and whatnot. But what always made them very interesting was the strengths that each one had from one another. In fact, this was even all the way back in the day when, even though there were level caps for non-human races, they had advantages that the human could not necessarily have. On top of this, you also had the various archetypes from like Elven Ranger, Orc Barbarian, and maybe this is just me, but those after a while always start to feel more like guidelines or just very accepted tropes that you could play but weren't forced to play. You know, I could play an Elf Barbarian if I want to, or a Minotaur Bard, or even play as an Orc Wizard. However, Wizards then released Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. That kind of changed everything with a optional rule. In that basically now you could say, I don't like these stats, I can, I want to arrange them in the way that best suits my character. And the thing is, if it was just that, an optional rule, I would be fine with that. But the thing is, I emphasize optional because every other race introduced after that book, from Wild Beyond the Witchlight, the Fizban's Treasury of Dragons, Monsters of the Multiverse that was like a mass reprinting, that rule of apply your stats anywhere just applied to everything now. And after having played 5e for so many years, using the old system, now just kind of saying you now have to use the new system just feels weird. It's like Wizards suddenly realized everyone else was having fun with this new optional rule and they made it permanent, but to people like me who were just fine using the rules as they were for, you know, so many years now, it's like we're kind of being forced into this. Moreover is just the fact that there's no more of a sense of like what archetypes are, it, it, even on like, a, at least for like a setting per setting basis. Like, I know, still from the Player's Handbook, based in the Forgotten Realms, elves have an innate uh, plus two dex, and depending on your sub-race, gets you that other bonus. Now, with the other races, though, if I want to play a classic archetype in a particular setting, I don't know what that is. What are the base... What would normally be the base stats for a Harrington? Normally, just in, like, its innate setting. I have kind of discussed this with a friend, and their argument ultimately came down to having this option opens up more possibilities of what characters they want and avoids the whole mid-maxing just to make a character work mechanically. 
like he wants to make the rooster lawyer from Futurama as a character and you know what that's fine I get it but even then like if we're playing in a particular setting and if some players really want to get invested with like the world or like there are certain rules that might need to be applied like it should still be like known let's say for example you wanted to play in the dragon age setting or warhammer fantasy battles and i wanted to play a dwarf to me it would be important to know that dwarves normally don't use magic or in warhammer they use magic via runes so unless there was a class for that that was specifically built i would want to know that rather than just hey i'm a dwarf wizard i'm the first of my kind i'm a special protag and all that like i think this opens up more for a discussion on like building a character around your setting versus like free form and like discussing with your dm and the other players of your expectations and all that or more so maybe you just want to do a very quick character build like you just want to do a very classic character just knowing what that classic archetype would be can just be helpful like let's say the archetype for a harrington is you know plus two decks and plus one wisdom or something or vice versa and you know basically that would mean like they're good as druids they're good as rangers they're good as rogues etc like that at least gives me a very quick build idea if i just wanted you know just first time you know coming into a setting or a game i want to know like what a typical archetype of this like race or character would be because sometimes i feel like kind of giving players too much choice can feel a bit overwhelming or they just don't know what to do with it sometimes when i was first introducing a friend to fifth edition he was building his human ranger and rather than going with the variant and like trying to pick out a feat he just didn't know what to pick out and so he actually just went with the base version with a plus one to everything kind of shocking to me but that's always kind of held my mind where sometimes just having all this like customization can kind of be a bit too much and just having not necessarily railroading but having just like uh, a well-treaded path in a forest is still an option instead of just trailblazing and trying to figure stuff out on your own i would even also just make a small argument that sometimes limitations of a race can spark creativity on how you want to build them or what their goal is as your character if i was still playing in the orc like the orc wizard concept but still with a negative intelligence modifier maybe my whole quest for that character is to find a way to remove that modifier and maybe just go even further beyond like that kind of what would the purpose be just a nice springboard to get creativity going sometimes i also just briefly want to bring up unearth arcana hi uh ed post editor me here um i have no idea what the hell i was talking about in this section I did not save the article, I don't know if things were changed, so I'm basically just cutting this section down and possibly out. But I do want to mention just height real quick, because this is also kind of a factor. One, with how Wizards is now just making any race kind of be any height, I think it eliminates the uniqueness of other races that were kind of known for that factor. And in terms of gameplay, with the disadvantage on heavy weapons, with I don't think a lot of people remember that and just it feels weird to then like want to play a small character that wields a big weapon but then remember the rules that go along with it it just it, it feels it's just it's odd to finally kind of end off on this with the whole tashas and how races are moving forward i feel like humans are now like less viable than before because previously before they were the very flexible class they could fit with any race you could take a variant and take any feat but now since every other like special monster-esque race can do this along with the fact that humans are like the one of the few races that doesn't have dark vision what's really the point of taking them they were previously maybe like bland white bread but you know still enjoyed by some wizards just took the bread away they're now just bland like i've heard the description that now every other race just feels like you're a human with a funny hat just you now have a special trait but you can still just call yourself a human outside of that the customization for your character in 5e still isn't perfect and there are still limitations to it a part of this is the bounded accuracy system which effectively is a way to keep player power in balance so as opposed to say in like third edition where a barbarian could grapple and body slam tiamat everyone is 
on a similar level but because of that it can also limit like how special your character may feel in a particular field let's take a wizard and an eldritch knight let's add some stats and let's say the wizard is specialized in arcana between the two classes the wizard only gets a slight bonus ahead of the eldritch knight but even then, considering when you have to think about DC scores, this isn't that much of a difference. At the same time, once you have figured out like your race, your class, ultimately subclass, and even your background, there's nothing else to advance your character afterwards when you actually start playing the game. There's nothing like future titles or, you know, more like special, even more subclass advancements. The closest you get is probably like epic boons, but that's not until you're like hitting like max level and there's nothing else to gain. There's no system mechanics on even say like getting a castle or even potentially running a kingdom if you want. We've also kind of just been stuck with the same basic equipment for years now. The book will even tell you if you want to run like a samurai character and you specifically want a katana, there's no like actual weapon stats for that. They just say rebrand a longsword. There's no profile to maybe have a basic weapon with a more unique feature to it. There's just no more new ideas for weapons. Shields are very bland and boring. You basically grab a shield and you now have a weaker but permanent version of the spell by the same name. There's no difference between a glaive and a halberd and the blowgun is arguably one of the worst weapons that you can pick if you want to use it. The only real advancement in terms of weapons are magical weapons and if you're not like homebrewing like a flame tongue to fit more with an axe you're just kind of stuck with the same thing over and over again. While it might not relate to customization so much stats also kind of lack a bit of variety or are just better to say unbalanced. Aside from maybe, you know, a different core stat your class might require, dexterity is usually the best simply because of what it provides outside of skills. That's maybe only followed up by constitution simply because more health is nice, and intelligence is probably just the one stat that everyone dumps because there's not much to use outside of that. And unless it's say like a core class stat like for a wizard or the artificer. To move on from this we now want to probably talk about combat, and I'm just going to say combat in 5th edition is not that great. If you are a DM trying to run combat, most of the monsters that you are looking up in your manual or whatever supplement books never really tell you how they attack, what their tactics are. I feel like a lot of time DMs will just run these very one note where they will where monsters will just charge the enemy and always fight towards the death. There's no there's never any description from wizards to tell you like how these monsters should fight. Additionally, the most basic monsters that you may even fight, the ones that are probably the most common, will almost never feel interesting. Something that I believe Matt Colville has talked about before in not just his own video, but also has tried to make third-party content in order to fix this. Combat itself can also just be very swingy sometimes if you're using the CR system or the XP encounter system because it is entirely shit. Mostly because certain monsters at a certain challenge rating may actually appear a lot more powerful than you might think. For example, if you have a party of level threes, like sure, that's pretty powerful, but against say like a couple of intellect devourers or maybe uh, a green hag if they're not like having a whole bunch of magic items quite yet it, it could turn south very quickly though one could also argue that typically combat will almost always favor the players more simply because they you know have better action economy they have more access to spells their equipment unless it's like a boss monster they also have like more health than the monsters around them going down for a party member isn't super worrying it still is but if you even just restore one health point like you remove all death saving throws it mostly feels like it comes down more towards like luck playing dumb or heavily being outclassed or outnumbered it to make the players actually feel like they can lose a fight. Though there's also now the returning verses of the marshals versus casters, something that while it is heavily hated, 4th edition tried to fix and remove. Magic just takes over the game no matter what the longer you play. There have been some arguments that, you know, you're, maybe you're supposed to run more encounters like the book suggests, but this is kind of seen as a straw man argument because it doesn't necessarily matter how many more encounters you run in the early game. 
It's what comes later as you play through the game more and more and level up. Classes like the fighter or, you know, nun, arcane trickster rogues, the barbarian just fail to keep up with, like, the wizard that can time stop or cast wish or, you know, maybe deal with enemies that can fly and cast more magic. But above all else, from what I can understand, most high-level play is not that exciting in 5th edition. In fact, it's almost described as boring sometimes. When I've talked to some friends or looked around the community, most agree that around, like, maybe level 8, 11, maybe 12 is kind of like the sweet spot for 5th edition simply because you're fairly high level but you're not like fighting gods. And magic casters don't like fully outclass marshals and all that. Like I think there's a reason why we only ever have one module printed that actually goes to the full level 20. To kind of wrap back around to the DM figuring out like CR encounters, being a DM is not that better in 5th edition. In fact, 5th edition almost favors the players way more in just terms of ease of play than it does for the actual dungeon master trying to run the whole game for them. There are no clear pricings for what magic items are. The, the lore for all the pre-generated worlds either feels very lackluster this edition or slowly has been getting cut out to, to various reasons, like with the previous erratas and the controversies. It more or less starts to come up to, like, you need to write up your own lore. Or you have to look back on a lot of books that previously did establish these settings, which I just, I don't get, because if you've already established these settings before, shouldn't you just be able to transfer everything over to the new edition now? and like just have it all ready for players to run from the get-go. The DM may also need to work out player backstories if that's going to be like the kind of campaign they're running. They need to figure out, in the DM's hands book, they need to figure out the world and just everything that's going on, which off of the official like Dungeon Master's Guide, it literally tells you to just create a multiverse. It, it doesn't say like just start out small and build from there. And with the way that 5e kind of has like somewhat set rules but still kind of plays loosey-goosey with them a bit like stuff is not fully specific in terms of like wording and rulings that you kind of have to come up with on the spot sometimes in play and to kind of go back on the topic of settings 5e has for some reason suddenly decided to branch out in like the last I don't know, third or quarter of its life now. Previously, we were only subject to the Forgotten Realms, and it was very nice because it was very focused. Though, granted, it also heavily focused a lot, maybe too much, on the Sword Coast region, and a lot of ventures will also still have some sort of influence with the players to go on these adventures because of them. But recently, you've gotten stuff like Spelljammer, Dragonlance, and as well as like a lot of the Magic the Gathering settings, which I'm just going to say right now I'm not a fan of because it that just kind of comes off as lazy, and a lot of them outside of Theros doesn't really appeal to me. And because of all this branching out now, I feel like it there's a lack of focus and drive to like make good quality content. Spelljammer is probably one of the more recent examples of this, probably due to the fact that it was one, rushed out, two, the controversy of the Hadozi, and three, just the writing on it is not that well explained. How to be a DM basically goes over this in more detail than I could right now, but a lot of it kind of comes down to the fact that its main selling point, like flying through space in like an actual ship and, you know, potentially having like naval ship combat, is weak. Dragonlance, a book that I personally bought because I thought the alternate cover had amazing drip. When I read through it, like the whole entire like lore part of For the World is like 20 pages and it doesn't even explain the whole world. It's mostly just a module and at the very end it says now you can explore Kryn or the world of it and it includes this big old map but it does not provide any sort of detail on like what those areas are or like the cultures and everything else. It's it's mostly just a module that you could just include in any campaign setting, and I think that's weak. And while I definitely think it's one of the better modules that has been released recently, Icewind Dale has, slight spoiler, has an ending where you go back in time, back to like before this city fell out of the sky, and then it just tells you, oh, now you can, you know, look up the history and like build your own adventures on here, 
without actually giving you any reference points to look up to, like, understand what the history was like during this age. It's just, it's completely out of the blue. And most of these are actually just adventure modules, not, like, campaign settings that you can reference and, like, set up your own adventures if you really, really wanted. Like, I think the only the last few might have been, like, Eberron and Wildbound to, like, properly do this. To start getting close to my final thoughts on the matter, I want to talk about just, like, Wizards of the Coast, 1D&D, and just kind of the hobby community a bit as a whole right now. Hi, editor me here again. Uh, I'm just going to be re-recording and taking over this last part because I just want to try and get it right. Wizards, ultimately, I feel is taking the criticism from Twitter far too much. Because, let's be honest, Twitter is absolutely insane. It's just, it's the same song and dance that we've kind of been seeing lately in just a lot of other hobby spaces. But I do want to make some points, however, before I even start delving into that. First off, I personally really don't like discussing politics or trying to get involved in politics. I'm not exactly the bravest to get into them since they're just very confusing and they're not always the easiest to find the right answer, plus after a while they just become boring. That is to say, I don't necessarily mind if you as an individual have certain political beliefs that you want to insert into your game, whether as a DM or a player. Many players in RPGs, you know, have, you know, kind of used characters to help, like, come out and all that. That's fine, whatever. If you're a DM and you use politics, just maybe so long as your players know and willingly accept, like, it's, it's whatever. It's, it's your game. On top of that, as much as I criticize the, quote, Twitter crowd, I, I don't necessarily think, like, being on the other end of the spectrum is that healthy either, since it's almost the same, but it, it's almost the exact same, just more or less pushing back. And at the same time, it just, it kind of gets a little ridiculous on what they will bitch and argue about. The Dead Space remake is probably the finest example, because in one of the few things I've seen complain about it is the bathroom sign despite the fact that bathrooms in the original game are designed the exact same way. The sign has only changed. My local game store has, like, a similar sign. It just, it's a sign. It doesn't change the bathroom. It's, this is fucking stupid to argue over. And on top of that, I will say there are the very rare cases that, you know, bringing up outcry or calling out racism is actually justified. There's a, there was an issue with, like, I think... Uh, Ernie Gygax and his, like, third iteration of TSR, where apparently, long story short, he really pulled a big racist. That's incredibly blunt. It's just, wow. <laughs> and that all being said, though, kind of going back to what my original point, I also just don't really think that trying to push beliefs, ideas, or politics onto others, or even throughout an entire game system, is fine. Just because you have issues with it doesn't necessarily mean everyone else does. Just, there's always a certain number of characteristics that I always find when it comes down to, like, arguing or dealing with this crowd every time, like, certain issues like this pop up. They will always think everything is political, no matter what. Uh, fairly recently, there was, uh, an artwork on, posted on Twitter where it was just, you know, it's, I think it's, like, Saber from Fate eating a burger. And yet, like, in one of the recent posts, like, you have these people just, like, jumping through hoops saying, like, oh, it's all this capitalism bullshit and with the East. And But meanwhile, the artist then later had to come out and just say, yeah, I just wanted to draw something cute. The crowd very frequently just feels narcissistic, very preachy, and just, like, this I'm better than you because my politics are right sort of attitude. They always just try to argue, like, it's, like, it's all oh, so much better to be super inclusive and diverse. And look, I do not want to say that is wrong, but I don't agree that always being super diverse and inclusive is always the best thing out there. That, that quote's not going to come back to bite me in the ass. I think a good example of this, though, if I want to explain, is, again, some... Uh, drama in the Warhammer community because very recently there were there were at least like I think a video and like a Twitter thread posting on like why uh, female space marines should be canon because you know I guess there's not enough female representation and yet I found like a response to that thread by a girl saying like yeah this is bullshit it's stupid to try and like force and change canon just to meet political quotas. Which I also have to agree, because Warhammer, when you really get down to it, has probably some of the better inclusivity, especially in recent years, of like the Adeptus Sororitas or Sisters of Battle. You have uh, more female representation in the Imperial Guard. You have like female Eldar. You know, there's a fair decent amount of representation there. 
And yet, people are still arguing, like, oh, but Space Marines are the poster boys. So, that means, you know, we should have poster women, I guess, which is super dumb. If you want poster women, just, I don't know, maybe try marketing the actual women in the setting already more. This also kind of makes me start asking one of two questions. Do the people complaining about this stuff and asking for change even regularly interact with this kind of stuff? Remember the orc controversy, the guy who started the whole thing? He apparently had a few tweets later stating, yeah, I don't even regularly play Dungeons & Dragons that much. Like, are you kidding me? This reminds me of that one dumb meme of, like, the smiling bomber just flying away. As, like, there's, like, an explosion behind it. Like, that, that, that's what I feel like this guy is. Then It also just kind of continues to think of, like, how often is, like, a vocal minority just going to cause outcry and have things change, but they don't actually then support those changes. They just, they want it there just to say, hey, good, let's move on to the next. One final note I kind of want to go off on, like, this particular note on the Twitter crowd is is kind of bringing up Connie Chang for, like, the example in the tabletop D&D space. And to give a very brief background, Connie is someone who ultimately started a, a video series of, like, a full, like, trans uh, player crowd, and they run D&D. They blew up during, like, the pandemic and all that. And, you know, that's fine. That's a, I personally think that's a very niche group and market to go towards. But the only reason I'm kind of bringing her up is because her second most popular video during, like, her prime is basically all about world building and how, essentially, Orientalism is bad. Or I am not going to personally get into that subject because I know very little about it, but... I took a look at the video myself from, like, the various clips just to see if, like, anything was taken out of context. And while I myself am also taking clips as well, I'm trying to take as much of the full video as possible. Just, just listen to what she says. Uh, so colonial in the most basic, like, dictionary, uh, Wikipedia definition terms, uh, means the occupation of one country by another with the intent to populate the occupied country with the occupier country's citizens, right? So like a colonialist attitude toward fantasy conflict would be something like, let's just go in and like kill all the orcs, right? They're the bad guys, who gives a shit? We just hack and slash and we loot their dead bodies, right? And this this suggests a very normative attitude toward fantasy that we uh, play and inhabit in our own uh, tabletop, you know, home games or even podcasts and live streams. You know, like what kinds of stories are we telling here, right? Like what does it mean for a place in the world to be quote unquote uncivilized or quote unquote uncharted, right? I mean, British colonizers thought the United States was uncivilized and uncharted. The United States. I'm using the colonizers term for 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 America, right? Um, you know, and this this kind of colonialist attitude justifies, you know, the genocide of indigenous peoples and continues to justify their oppression to this day. Orientalism is the fetishized construction of an orient through which the West creates an understanding of itself as a superior and civilized culture. What kind of what kind of uh, narrative does this construct about the world, right? One where white people know more, right, about the other's issues than the other knows about themselves. If we look at the player's handbook, 5th edition, right, uh, orcs are inherently brutish, primitive, and savage. They have like a minus two intelligence ability score increase, decrease. If you decide to play like an, like an orc character, you like can't change that. It's like illegal to homebrew that out of Adventurer's League, right? And, you know, historically and even now, I would argue, and a lot of people, you know, would argue that orcs and other inherently evil races like goblinoids, you know, in general, are often used as stand-ins, right, for black people. Asian people, you know, disabled people, Jewish people, etc. A common rebuttal I hear to this argument is that, well, you're the real racist here. If you think of black, Asian, Jewish, disabled, etc. people, when you look at orcs, I don't think of that. I'm, well, I don't see race. Uh, <laughs> I think that's a really fucking weak argument for several reasons uh, because it completely ignores the context of like literally everything. Uh, so my question to y'all, you know, folks who are maybe on the fence or like not so convinced. Uh, when are you gonna fucking see it? You know, everyone else does. When the fuck are you gonna see it? <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Chief conceit, right, of Orientalism is the creation of this imaginary other, right, on which whiteness projects its own fears, its own lack of self-worth, its own degradation. 
Uh, like, the ones who are raping, raiding, murdering, genociding, exploiting, torturing, bombing, kidnapping. It's not fucking orcs, dude. It's fucking you. Get your shit together. I think it's really funny that it's the same people that jump to defend Game of Thrones, right? Being overly, overwhelmingly white, you know, except for, of course, the brown savage slavers. Uh-huh. Uh, because it's supposed to be fantasy Britain, right? And black people don't exist in Britain, you know? Like, uh, but at the same time, it's the same people that are like, oh, this isn't about race or Europe or Britain. If you see that you're racist, like, you can't have your cake and eat it, too. Sh fucking shut up. Um, this is the most obnoxious thing I've ever experienced in my life. This is someone that Wizards invited to do a video on their YouTube channel. I just, I don't get it. So, kind of moving on to the next point is usually then if sources or materials or franchises do start expanding now into, like, being diverse and whatnot, the quality of it tends to suffer or be more lackluster and please do not get this wrong i do not personally think that adding diversity is causation for franchises fail or poor writing but it does seem a lot in correlation like the rings of power for example let's face it this i kind of knew from the moment i saw advertisements of a black dwarf it's like this is going to tank and other reviews overall have also just been pretty negative of it after now it is like fully finished i think a better example is netflix's the witcher i only managed to watch the first season and and later i found out it does have like issues apparent from the book but i thought it was decent but then from like fan reactions of the second season it basically just started diverging and the, honestly the latest news of blood origins it basically i think kind of tells you the rest of the story it also doesn't help that like the lead showrunner has like a whole bunch of tweets that basically kind of contradict how everything in the show would go it it's it's just it it's bad kind of while on the subject it does kind of then lead to of uh, say race swapping and all that other stuff which ultimately gets very very messy there was the controversy over like the little mermaid that you know caused the internet to spiral it it also briefly uh got me kind of talking with one of my game store like owners about like they're willing to change like a character like Ariel to fit more of an agenda, but they are dare not going to touch someone like Tarzan to like a different ethnicity. Now you can make the argument that all this is mostly reserved down to fictional characters, but that's not always the case. There was a British TV series of Anne Boleyn where the actress they cast was, I mean, let's face it, she was black as opposed to Anne Boleyn who was very clearly white. I have nothing against the actress, but it does raise a question on if you're going for a historical piece like this, why, why, why do this casting? I do think this starts getting over to the issues on how much history people will dig up in order to justify the representation or how much history is willing to change to fit modern day quotas for representation. I know a while back there was talk about like, oh, there were, there were like new findings of like black Vikings existing and that's great, but it also raises the question on what was the ratio to that and like where in time were that similarly i know in japan there was the first black samurai of yasuke which honestly got a pretty dope ass looking anime which i still need to watch and you know i think that's fine i think that's a fine story to tell but i do feel like that then immediately justifies some people saying like oh well japan was then super racially diverse back in the past which i think kind of eliminates the whole context and just kind of starts turning into like manipulation this i don't necessarily want to get too more deep into this kind of topic like, so i'm just going to leave off with just saying like check out some of these videos metatron does videos on like the book netflix's barbarians and valhalla series which i think goes deeper into these kind of issues of just not even necessarily blackwashing just more like historical inaccuracies and just some guy i think kind of goes over the topic a lot more both in comics and just various depictions as a whole one of the bigger points i really did want to mention earlier here and when it comes down to this is a lot of the time twitter just kind of feels like they will throw anyone under the bus if they disagree with them or all, all just to raise diversity essentially it also just it, it feels almost sometimes like a double standard because you know they don't like them or whatever there was like the whole scandal with like mr beast actually like actually putting like his million dollar money to help people be unblind or cure their blindness and and yet there was backlash of like he's doing this to prop up uh, fame even though that's you could argue that he kind of needs to do that so he can kind of keep doing good things with his actual money there was uh, a segment by hero hey about a gundam voice actor and like 
the problem of like how a minor how the person doing the voice a voice actor someone who is mostly chosen because of the voice was not the right minority to voice a character and there were like other voice actors like you're talking about against this i can't really explain it you just you gotta go see that segment as well but moreover the hypocrisy just comes out as like they want to stop like the hate by essentially spreading hate the the new harry potter game of hogwarts secrets i think is probably the best example because you know it, it was one thing for like people announcing a boycott you know whatever fine you don't like jk rowling but apparently then i got on my feed of like there was like harassment to like one of the streamers just simply playing the game it is so much so like apparently like their girlfriend started to cry they started going after asmogold also was not apparently spared from this as i kind of discovered from the thumbnail and even more recently apparently there was like a string of tweets from a soldier trying to insult people for buying a video game this is ridiculous but more so again kind of going back to whole like throwing people under the bus is kind of with this pbs article now on Dungeons and dragon the whole article here just like it's like talking about like how you know it's great to have like a full diverse cast of like women and you know color and all that but as soon as it comes down to like oh but then there was a stereotype of like white men in basements it's, it's almost brought in a negative light there's also the statement of, like, people who play OSR, or Original Source Renaissance, basically old-school D&D, are seen as problematic. These orcs are trying to hold on to dying traditions. It's just, it's ridiculous. I'm like, you want to promote diversity and, you know, get everyone equal, but some people still need to be thrown under the treads. To kind of to start closing this off is, even when they do get something that they want, even when they do sec technically start getting change, it's not always enough, or it's not the right change that they immediately want. With one D and D, uh, they basically change the term race now from species, which you know argue on that how you will, but apparently that's not enough to some. The Asians represent podcast uh, basically kind of in a similar situation with Connie Chang basically got together and voiced their opinions on it and like before I took a gander at it, it it's it, it's about as much as you would think I love that they got rid of the term race but species is not a great choice species means a whole lot of different things and there's no agreed upon definition of species I don't necessarily see it as like less problematic either because I mean I've been reading a whole lot of Robert E. Howard lately yeah. and yeah, like that's right. his discussions his letters with H.P. Lovecraft on oh, like okay. the different races of the yeah. world and how different um, you know ethnicities are like subspecies or inferior mm -hmm. species and H.P. Lovecraft injecting his own thoughts into Robert E. Howard's a thesis to to make it even more racist somebody on twitter basically said that like switching from race shows that wizards is acknowledging the problem with the term race but moving to species doesn't resolve like the underlying issue of like essentialism in DD, &D, and it just brings up different problems it's like hey let's take one really problematic term and then replace it with another problematic term that's going to cause yeah. other problems and maintain the exact same problems. The use of race in D&D &D and other like fantasy RPGs is that races are interpreted as different species. So it's like reinforcing the argument of the toxic aspect of the community by using this term. Every, every individual is an ancestry. And instead of making them subcategories of other ancestries, you go upward. So the... Mm grouping becomes higher order instead of subcategories so like I, 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 so I like you're that. literally you're literally you would literally go into Linnaean taxonomy you could do like a class you'd be your class would be like immortals or something like mm -hmm. that and the yeah. order would yeah. be elves there are people that do not like the term a species simply because they think it's out of place in a fantasy game if this were a science fiction game or some sort of futuristic setting game or if this were just like spell jammer and aliens mm -hmm. what would you guys think about the usage of species because i think it's really a matter of aesthetic right because a lot of people associate like if they're like oh species sounds so sci-fi but the mm -hmm. problem still remains because mm -hmm. you still have to clearly define what you mean by species. If you're like, this alien is a distinct species from whatever humans are, why? My fear is that if they do some sort of like hierarchy, they lean into that like chain of being concept from medieval Christianity. 
where they're like, mm. there's like God and then angels. That's that's my my fear is that they will enable players to take it too far, right? To enable players to like codify these sort of systems of oppression into their game. Another thing I noticed in the playtest document is that they also use the word culture. And within like three paragraphs, they say life forms for a species. Also, they say sapient, which I feel like they will run into some issues down the line, mm -hmm. uh, given the origins of the term sapient. Yeah, they want sapient things, which is troubling or sentient, we could even say. But even then, it's like... <laughs> uh, they say upbringing, training. Um, but then they also go and they say cultures. All of that is actually removed from species. So mm -hmm. when you say like, oh, you are an Ar Ardling, one of these new ones, right? You could have like the tail of a squirrel. Are Ardlings with wings different from Ardlings with squirrel tails? This is the kind of discussion that I don't want to have to have when I'm making a character. I just want to say, hey, yeah, I have wings. Let's move on. Also, species as a term is you can't separate it from evolution. And evolution is also a fraud. There was a response on Twitter that was like, well, Neanderthals and humans are distinct species. Therefore, I'm okay with this. I was like, thanks, white guy. But also like, there's a lot of debate as to the fact that they are not distinct species. It's not agreed upon. And they're kind of leaning in on the fact that they said the term species was chosen in close coordination with multiple outside cultural consultants. I am really worried that they're basically using that as kind of like a, hey, we, we leaned in on a cultural consultant. I'd really love to know who that individual is, like privately. Uh, I'd love to know who that person is because like, what is their background? I know that most cultural consultants in the TTRPG space are typically folks who have history backgrounds. And I think if you are somebody with a history background and you're talking about something like this, you are missing out on the vast majority of the discourse around the term species. And I think that can get really complicated when you're introducing a game to people and asking them to say, create a character and then have them identify with uh, or have them belong to a biological species. How do you justify half elves or half orcs? Which, which species, which definition of species are we sticking with? Are we saying that humans in Karatur are different from humans on the Sword Coast if we're leaning in on like the reproductive isolation? Like are the eco species? Because that's a term. Species is also just an ugly word. It really it's is. It's not fun to look at or to say. Like, <laughs> Can you imagine like your that. session zero when you're like, so what species are you? Some might argue for heritage. Heritage is a tricky term because it's become like an official institution in a lot of ways. That's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Shut up! Oh my God, I don't care! Daniel, mind you, has also made a full 24-hour series reviewing the old Orientals Adventures book, which is like 40 plus years old at this point. And I swear, three minutes into the first part, he just says, like, it's trash. Legend of the Five Rings, it's also trash. Shit, you know, I almost forgot to mention, Daniel has also tried just to get the full, like, Oriental Adventures book, like, banned or just off the shelf digitally because reasons... Look, undoubtedly the book has, like, bad stereotypes. It's a 40 plus year old book. Even then, from what I can look up on, like, online PDFs, the creators, the original creators of that book, I, from the sounds of it, they weren't necessarily just trying to create stereotypes. They were just, they were doing their best to research this and create a setting just for more player variety. And on top of that, reading some of the comments on, like, DMs Guild, you know, some, like, some people of both, like, mixed Asian origins or just even people from Asia, like, they, they enjoyed it. You know what, I'm just going to add this next point is that, the Twitter crowd always feels like they want to speak for people, but as soon as, like, the people they're trying to speak for, like, aren't offended, it's like, they, they almost are just confused. Like, I remember Mike Pondsmith of uh, Cyberpunk 2077, like, got into a bit of controversy. This, uh, more specifically, was, like, uh, one of the gangs were called animals and they were mostly black, but he kind of stood his ground as just, like, was tired of, like, of, like having people tell him, like, what he should and shouldn't be offended by. It's... It, it's like it, really people just can't understand like other people like even like minorities can't decide on like what is and isn't offensive to them so in retrospect like these are all the major points of just like what i view like the twitter crowd and what wizards is like listening towards and it's just it's so much to deal with and it's just, again most because most of the controversies of like the orc and hadozi have always come from twitter and they're just like immediately changing that shit but it, it, it kind of to move away from all that and really kind of get on to like this last segment that I really want to talk about because this was brand new, of course, as I'm editing this and I just, I want to bring it up. 
it, it was an interview uh, by the group Three Black Halflings, and they were basically talking to executive producer of Wizards of the Coast, Kyle Brink, on just, like, the previous OGL controversy, which I just don't want to talk about. This is already long enough. Here's, like, a bullet point version. Go look up the rest of the details. But essentially, they were just giving him questions and interviewing him on, like, the whole debacle. And again, I kind of just learned about this from a clip show. It honestly kind of had me fuming just a little bit when I found out about it, but considering I took the time to look at both Connie and Asians Represent, I decided to just to calm myself down first, look at the main source, find it, and then look at the full clip. So here's the full clip. Uh, in terms of hiring diversity, um, this actually speaks to one uh, one thing that Orion Black said in their statements, which is that they believed that they were essentially a diversity hire, which look, we're all here, we're all in favor of diversity, but ultimately I think what makes the difference in a company like this is if you have minority people in positions of power. And while I'm sure that there have been numerous hirings of people from a variety of different minorities, at least in the case of racial minorities, I've met a number of people who, including yourself, who are fairly high up in D&D, &D, uh, and I think every single one of them has been white. And also, I think all of them have been cis men, not to say that everybody there is a cis man, but it seems to be consistently that we have white cis men still at the top of these yeah. groups. Can you identify any specific positions of like significant power? Because um, you got you got I mean, even on the D&D &D team, you still got uh, you've still got Jeremy Crawford. Uh, you still got uh, Mike Merles and so forth. What can you identify any specific uh positions that have like higher ranking positions that have been filled by people of say racially diverse backgrounds uh, i think if you look at the the credits of our books um you'll see some lead designers there who are are uh not cis men uh you will also see a lot of uh primary authors on sources uh these are folks who are coming up through the ranks and proving themselves and uh earning their respect not because of who they are but because of how they are as professionals uh, which is the best kind of respect, right? You know, you don't want to be respected because you're the diversity hire. You want to be respected because you're awesome at your job. Uh, and that's uh, and that's happening more and more. Um, this, you know, look, guys like me, we're, we're leaving uh, the workforce, to be blunt. And we're also not, this is not the face of the hobby anymore. I'm not the majority of this hobby anymore. Uh, and I, I, and so it's important to me that my team of creators look like my players, and have the lived experience that my players do. Uh, and I think there's been mistakes made in years past where people assumed that D&D &D players were all, you know, white dudes in a basement, um, which, is, which has been a faulty assumption for a lot of years and gets more and more false every day. Uh, and so it's, in my viewpoint, honestly, guys like me can't, can't leave soon enough um, for this hobby. Uh, and... We owe you good games. We owe you good products. And so we need to make sure that everybody working on it is real good at it. Um, and that means not just hiring, but also developing, right? When we bring people in who are good, we need to empower them, give them more room to run, give them guidance on what we learned when we were creating stuff so that they can create great stuff too. Um, and then, you know, I always hire people smarter than me so that I can get out of their way. That's my approach. Uh, and so as, as long as we stay on this trajectory, yeah, this is... This is the face of D&D will literally change. The last part there is kind of what really irks me. There has since been kind of a Reddit post on the D&D subreddit that kind of like says it's taken out of context. You know, you can you can read through that and and decide all you want. But after right off the heels of another previous controversy, like the damage is already kind of being done here. You can't change what you said. It, just the way that he says it, though, he was talking about the executives he switches over to, like, the stereotypical view of the hobby as a whole, and then he says that line. Like, to me, he wasn't necessarily talking about the executives. He he switches the subject a bit and then just talks about the hobby as a whole. Even if he was still kind of talking about the higher executives, it, it does just kind of feel weird of just like, yeah, I can't wait for them to get kicked out. He could have absolutely worded it better to avoid the situation of just like, you know, we want to eventually, you know, we want to eventually bring more people on, you know, just more variety, get different perspectives, have really try to represent not just 
not just our player base, but throughout the company. You know, just something more along the lines of that would have been better, but we're stuck with this. And to me, this really does now also have to ask, like, what other executives or a higher authority or just anyone in the company right now it has the same mindset because unfortunately this has also kind of reminded me of a previous incident from of like the magic side of wizards that kind of posted something similar on like hiring practices and that guy still currently works at wizards it's it's just upsetting and you know what i think i just want to get into my final thoughts after yeah i'm just <sighs> this is honestly has just worn me out that i'm sick of talking about this so i just kind of want to get into my final thoughts D&D really is just in a mess right now from my point of view. 5th edition especially is in a really weird, messy position because despite all my all the issues that I brought up with it, it I don't necessarily think it's the worst system. Like, it, it's just, it's not terrible. The flaws with, like, the equipment and, you know, like, Marshall's versus Casters mostly just comes down to based on that design, and that can always come down to, like, various editions throughout the years but other issues that have kind of popped up over the years that i personally have taken like the changes to character creation the lack of focus of like one setting and just suddenly branching out all the just various design choices of like lack of lore and like some of the modules that come out most of those changes mind you also came out from needless controversies started by individuals and a crowd that view <laughs> They basically just witch hunt on what they want to be the next racist thing to, like, bring down. down. Or just, they try to cover shitty actions by trying to act virtuous. Even though, like, I guarantee if you dig deep enough or look, you can find, like, people, examples of this crowd being basically complete hypocrites. That's not to say, however, that everyone in this crowd or, like, trying to bring up issues like this is bad. Legal Kimchi is probably one of the bigger examples I kind of forgot to mention earlier, which, uh, unlike, say, like, Connie or, or Daniel, like, he actually has, like, production. Like, there's a script. It feels like he did research. And on top of that, the ending doesn't, like, berate you for, like, following the old thing. He it never feels like he's trying to mock you or like put you down it it actually does give me a bit more respect for him at the very least but even then besides all that though when you are just kind of bringing like these issues up you, ultimately it just feels like you're dividing the fan base which kind of gets worse when as over time which is the coast usually ends up taking the side has mostly ended up taking the side and changing this stuff, which, let's be honest, it's just mostly them to f save face as a company and try to keep profits up. It, but even then, afterwards, it's just like now over the past couple of years, they can't get out of any controversy. From the orcs, uh, there was like a Ryan Black that I never got to, just, you can look that up, there was a Hadozi, the OGL, which... I just I had it completely cut out because it's just like it came and then it's now finally finished and then now of course the Kyle incident honestly the Kyle incident to me is just kind of the final straw at this point like I just I can't really trust wizards at this point I'm just I'm sick of the bullshit it's also just hard for me to trust wizards with like the news of more monetization for one D&D going forward and like the virtual tabletop Hell, even with, like, the past OGL uh, controversy, like, all this apparently is kind of giving echoes of the past of, like, what 4th edition went through. And, who knows, maybe also was, like, very monetizable with, like, miniatures and whatnot. So, it's it's definitely concerning. Like, I love 4th edition, but it's not perfect. <laughs> and this does kind of worry me. But even then, like, am I fully going to quit Dungeons & Dragons? Am I just going to completely cut it out of my life? I don't think so. Like, I think at best, like, I might just restart collecting some 4th edition books. I might finally be looking a lot more into 3.5 since I picked those, a few of those up not too long ago. Uh, third party uh, content sources uh, for 5e is also a very high possibility. Like, I've, I picked up, like, a, like Grim Hollow. I picked up, like, an old, like, uh, Sword and Sorcery Conan style module. I, I backed Kensei. Uh, not too long ago, that looked fun, and honestly, at worst, I might just be looking at other RPG systems. Like, even despite my comments, I might be looking at Pathfinder 2nd Edition, I might be looking to the Conan RPG. There's, like, a, 
a Lord of the Rings uh, RPG that has also kind of come out. So that might also be fun to look into. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's hard for me to really trust a company that's getting themselves more and more into trouble. That's something that does bother me just a little bit with how things are going and just... I don't know. I guess one final note is I have absolutely no idea what the quality of this video is going to finally truly be. It's I've delayed this for so long. I've tried to just keep it as focused, but all this stuff popped up and I just wanted to talk about it. It's, it, it's just, it feels like a jumbled mess. I feel like I had a few jokes land and I'm happy about that, but, and uh, yeah, hopefully the next video uh, I put up will kind of be a bit more positive or just more fun, I think. Uh, that's all I really got to say. I'll uh, see you in the next video, I guess.